So we must do two things, two great things together to encompass that enormous new view that lies before us, but to encompass it within the framework of science, to see it within the whole categorical framework of science, and to see that these two are not separate, but that they are wedded. The bigness of the idea, the newness of the idea, the greatness of it is one with the structure of science, the structure of being itself. So then we come to a, uh, a summarization on page 572, line 3 to 18. that in the fulfillment of love, sin is reduced to its native nothingness. And the marginal heading there is the native nothingness of sin. That error is traced back to its native nothingness. Thus we see in both the first and last books of the Bible, in Genesis and in the Apocalypse, that sin is to be Christianly and scientifically reduced to its native nothingness. You see how she compares again Apocalypse with Genesis? As though to say, remember now the same thing happened in the first and second records of creation. The same thing happened in that second creation with Cain going out with that with that mortal concept being built up from a mist and building and building and building itself up to the point where it begins to destroy itself and to go out and Cain was uh, sent out into the land of Nod and here she says it is the same story in Revelation with that dragon, that error is reduced to its native nothingness. Love one another is the most simple and profound counsel of the inspired writer. Isn't that a funny thing to come in here? Love one another and where did we begin when we began the uh, section on the true woman? We began with principle, with that uh, uh, fact that, that we can't understand the idea of the principle or the principle if we hate our neighbor. So she's bringing the, full, the uh, whole thing full circle again to show us that She's given the method for working out that proposition of loving one another, of how to love. He says you have the principle now. It's the principle of Christianity, of demonstration, of how, to, uh, how that principle works in each one of us to bring us to the point of loving one another. And that if there's something that we don't love, if we feel that there is something unloving in us, then we know that we're still in the Michael sense, that we're still in that standpoint of Michael. Naturally, this loving one another is the loving of the idea of God. It isn't loving people. It isn't loving mortals. It isn't a second degree standpoint. It is a very high standpoint. It is a spiritual standpoint. She says in science, see in science, not in suffering, but in science, we are the children of God. We are the children of God. Just 
uh, reminds one of that uh, seventh beatitude. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Whatever is of material sense or mortal belongs not to his children. For materiality is the inverted image of spirituality. You see, the, um, the whole process has brought us through that uh, self-abnegation experience, hasn't it? Where we have a new self. We have a new self. We have the selfhood of life, truth, and love. We have the same I as life, truth, and love as life represented by the father, truth represented by the son, love represented by the mother. So that is a new selfhood. It is that selfhood that can love one another, you see, and that loves the idea of God, that sees only the idea of God, doesn't see people. That grid of consciousness doesn't see people. And uh, so that, uh, she says, whatever is of material sense belongs not to his children. It um, reminds one very much of the, um, in the platform. If you know the platform in that first vertical of the word at uh, the point of science, the word as science, uh, on the two levels of divine science and absolute Christian science, she uh, gives there the triunity in divine science, the triunity of that word, of that deific creator. And then in the absolute uh, Christian science tone, uh, she gives a funny quote. It's a, she says, for we are also his offspring. And when you first read it, you think, gosh, that, you know, it just doesn't make any sense at all. But the more you go over those categories, the more you see that, that she's saying that, um, that we are that idea of life, truth, and love. That God himself, the word itself, is life, truth, and love, and that we are the idea of life, truth, and love. For we are also his offspring. And that's what that section on the self-abnegation as that rule in Christian science brings out. That we are stamped with divine science. We are patterned with divine science. As every idea is patterned according to uh, the triunity of that divine principle. And then, under the um, marginal head heading, Fulfillment of the Law, we get a, a statement that seems to summarize the visions that we've seen. Love fulfills the law of Christian science. How appropriate that we are in love and we have come to the conclusion of the matter, and she says, love fulfills the law of Christian science. Nothing short of this divine principle, understood and demonstrated, can ever furnish the vision of the apocalypse. Now, let me read it again and see if this doesn't remind us of the first vision of principle, where we had the vision of that principle of Christianity. Nothing short of this divine principle understood and demonstrated can ever furnish the vision of the apocalypse. <coughs> then the second vision of life opens the seven seals of error with truth, the analysis. Then the third vision or uncover the myriad illusions of sin, sickness, and death. 
right? The, the trumpets, the uncovering of the trumpets. Under the supremacy of spirit, it will be seen and acknowledged that matter must disappear. The annihilation of the fourth vision of love. Did you hear that? Good. So we have before us the, um, the remaining three visions, the vision, the fifth vision of soul, which will show us the actual annihilating of all evil in Revelation. The sixth vision of spirit, which is the vision we're all waiting for of the new heaven and the new earth and the, the city four square. And the seventh vision of mind uh, showing the full manifestation of the idea. So where we are now is that we are going to go quickly back to Revelation to look at chapters 13 through 18 to see what the method, the Michael method is, how it is depicted in Revelation, how that method brings us right to the same point that Mrs. Eddy assumes now in the textbook. She does not take any of the substance of those chapters 13 through 18 because she is taking the Gabriel standpoint. Can you see that? That uh, those chapters in Revelation 13 through 18 depict the standpoint of a former age. She's now moving into the age of love. So her unique mission is to show the method of love, as much as to say, Revelation showed the method of truth. I'm going to show the method of love. And with the method of love, we can step right in to that 21st chapter, right into that uh, point where the new heaven and the new earth appear. You know, Max uh, reminds us that John was the only one that didn't sleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. That apparently he didn't sleep because he recorded it and uh, was the only one who watched with Jesus for that one hour. You remember Jesus said, could you not watch with me for one hour? Couldn't you, couldn't you take that question, what is God, for one hour and look at that with me? And I think that's uh, one point that I want to make this week is that we have to learn to watch we have to be, we have to learn to watch for one hour. Seems to be the most difficult thing. We don't have to learn to listen to tapes for one hour or read the books for one hour or be in the classroom for one hour. That comes very naturally to us. It comes naturally because it's mostly uh, still an objective activity. But to watch for one hour is a subjective activity. Could you not become subjectively one with me for one hour over that definition of God? Could you not come out from the principle with me, see? And uh, that that is what is going to open up everything for us, prepare the way for us. It somehow belongs to 
the quality of love and the experience of love and the accepting of that divine infinite calculus. We can listen to tapes and uh, take notes and read books and be in the class and still have a certain measure of closedness, closedness, because it's an objective activity. But to watch for one hour, do you know what I mean to watch for one hour? To work consciously over that definition of God. What is mind? What is spirit? What is soul? Principle, life, truth, and love. And this is what readied John for the, for the vision, for the consciousness that could accept that revelation. He was open to science. So let's remember that and see if we can't uh, nurture that and culture that in whatever way, in the simplest way. You know, I sometimes uh, say that you have to, to trick the human mind. You have to say, well, I'll just uh, do it for 15 minutes. I'll take 15 minutes. Now, who can't sit down for 15 minutes to entertain what God is, to entertain that question? And what you'll find is that if you sit down for 15 minutes, it will become more than 15 minutes. It will grow. It will grow with us. But, but we have something to give to the idea. Yes, the idea is safe. No, nothing will ever take that idea away. Yes, the earth is helping the woman. But that doesn't mean that we can sit back and just say, oh good, now I know the idea is safe and, and the Christ will take care of it and it will just go on and on and on. And, uh, and it doesn't matter about me. That is to say, I don't have to do anything then to, uh, to help that idea. But we are part of that earth, aren't we, in a way. We're part of that compound idea that, uh, that supports the spiritual idea, that welcomes the spiritual idea, that nurtures it. And we have a, an active role. Consciousness is an active thing. As we saw at the close of that um, Christ order, to open the door, to not be lukewarm, to be hot, to, to be a doer, to be actively one with that mind, to put on the mind of Christ. You see, is to go with the idea, with the whole flow of the idea. And then we are ready for the, the next revelation of that idea. Okay, so we come now to, uh, uh, back to Revelation. We finished chapter 12. We are at chapter 13. We've just finished that wonderful sense that um, um, of rejoicing. Remember that fourfold rejoicing that we had? And then at the close of that um, rejoicing, remember it was uh, a loud voice in heaven and um, the sense of the power of the Christ that the accuser is cast down, that they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Rejoice, ye consciousness that is one with that standpoint of love. And then comes in the other side of the coin, woe. Huh? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea 
for the devil is come down to you. You have something still to work through. You have to work it through on another basis than the rejoicing of the Gabriel sense. All right, let's have a look at that. Let's see what that implies. And so, um, Revelation 13.1 begins, And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Can you hear that? I stood on the sand of the sea. You stand on sand, you're not on that rock, that calculus, are you? It's the opposite of the calculus. It's a, it's a broken calculus. It's a um, sandy <laughs> calculus. The sand of human reasoning, human calculating, you see? All the brokenness of human reasoning, the illogical sense of human reasoning. It's the sand of the sea. Whenever you have the sea, you have the uh, that tempest-tossed uh, human concepts where you never know whether you're coming or going or not. It's that turbulent uh, sense that hasn't been resolved. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, out of, out of error. And John Dorley says that beast is materia medica, the belief of life in matter. And the beast had seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns and the name blasphemy. And the beast had great authority and one of his heads was wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed. Just like Materia Medica seems to be able to, to heal seems to have a great authority, a lot of power, you know. And the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the beast, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, three and a half again, three and a half. And I beheld another beast. There are two beasts coming up out of the earth. The first one came out of the sea, and you remember that uh, the right foot or dominant power of that angel was on the sea, and the secondary power was exercised on um, visible air and audible sin. So that's uh, shown here first the beast out of the sea then the beast out of the earth which had two horns this beast is false theology the beast had two horns spirit and matter the mixing of spirit and matter and spake as a dragon and caused the people to worship the first beast. Isn't that what you see about uh, false theology and false religion? Not that uh, pure and undefiled religion, but that false religion uh, that really um, worships materia medica. And um, makes fire come down from heaven. There's your Bible thumpers, huh? And caused all to receive a mark in their forehead, that sense of the uh, hell and damnation and penalty of, of false theology to um, misidentify man to stamp man with the wrong identity caused all to receive a mark in their forehead 
the number of the beast. And the number of the beast was six hundred three score and six. That six 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 supposed to be the number of man. So there is a statement of the a problem. Evidently, uh, John Dorley felt that uh, John was stating the, uh, the problem in a very fundamental way as the, the whole claim, the whole calculus of Materia Medica and the calculus of false theology. As we go on, we'll see that the false sense of science uh, comes in too, so that we have those three great uh, issues of science, theology, and medicine. Then we come to chapter 14, and chapter 14 is going to give us the answer. Now, it presents us with the answer to standing on the sand of the sea. That materia medica and false theology is always sandy ground. They are no real calculus to us. Nothing really that we can get our hands on and calculate with properly. So what is the answer to standing on the sand of the sea? Chapter 14, verse 1 begins, And I saw a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. Can you hear the opposite? Huh? The one is I stood on the sand of the sea, and the other is a lamb standing on Mount Zion. So you have that lamb sense again, that Christ-like sense, that Christ-like consciousness that is standing on a calculus, that Mount Zion. The Lamb of God is the spiritual idea of love, Mrs. Eddy says in the glossary, self-immolation, innocence and purity, sacrifice. And Zion is spiritual foundation and superstructure, inspiration, spiritual strength. And with the Lamb, with him 144,000, the true sense of man, true sense of the demonstration of manhood, the demonstration of Christianity, you hear that we're picking up the, much of the symbolism that we had in the earlier parts of uh, Revelation. And that 144,000 having his father's name, his father's name, his Christ, father's word name, written in their Christianity foreheads having his father's name written in their foreheads. Do you hear? Word, Christ, Christianity. And I heard the voice of harpers, and they sung, as it were, a new song. So here we are, back to that new song, back to scientific metaphysics scientific Christianity, scientific metaphysics. They sung, as it were, a new song before the four beasts and the elders. See, as long as we haven't reached the standpoint of science yet, we have that wonderful way of scientific metaphysics. We have that wonderful way of Christianity, of scientific Christianity. Before the throne, they sang it before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. 
Only that real man, only that spiritual man can sing that song. These were they which were not defiled with women, with a false sense of woman. You see, they haven't been touched with a false sense of woman. For they were virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, the Lamb-like consciousness, the Christ-like consciousness. There was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So we see that we can work, work it out in truth, that working it out in truth is working it out in scientific metaphysics. And scientific metaphysics is not so bad because it gives us the one, see the one that sits on the throne, and it gives us the four, the four beasts before that throne, and it gives us the 24, it gives us those elders, the whole realm of scientific metaphysics.